<laughs> G'day, guys, and uh, how are we going? Already a few guys are already on already. Um, good to see you, a few on, on here tonight, and hopefully it's all coming through all loud and clear and you can hear everything's going on. Big fella Dave Land, how are you going there tonight? And, uh, yeah, uh, he's just poor, you, you, you already had one, so you said you were going to have one tonight. So, um, And, big fella, thanks very much, guys, there, dropping in tonight. So tonight's topic, and this is one that I sort of get asked a little bit about after, you know, all of my solo videos when they sort of come through, and that's about solo camping. Now, you know, you want to give it a go, but you're a bit unsure, you know, about going out there by yourself and that sort of thing. So what fair income is holding you back? That's the topic we're going to sort of talk about tonight as we go forward. Um, this will be quite a good topic because I'll be pretty interested to uh, hear some of you guys, you know, that are maybe thinking about going through and uh, maybe doing some some uh, solo camping stuff lay down the track. If it's all coming through loud and clear, that's good. Dave, thanks very much, guys. Uh, thanks very much. It's all coming through loud and clear. Greatly appreciate that. Um, yeah, Leanne, nothing stops you. Yeah, I've, uh, I know some of the solo stuff that you go and do. And that's pretty amazing, especially uh, for a female to go and do what you do. It's pretty full on. Right, so I've got, again, I've prepared a bit of a list here. So we're going to go through this bit of a list that I've got going on here um, about solo camp and stuff, maybe a few tips as we go through. And for anyone who's sitting on the fence, you know, you especially with, you know, with the climate we all now live in, um, maybe some of you sit on the fence and maybe like to maybe go and dabble a little bit of solo camping and see how you go. Well, this fair income, this will be uh, quite helpful for you, I reckon. So we'll get through the first one. Now, look, solo camping, um, yeah, look, it's not for everybody, but I tell you what, if um, if you can get onto it, it's an absolutely amazing experience. Now, don't get me wrong, look, I like going away with people as well. You know, I like to go away with, with some of my mates and, you know, and groups of people sit around a campfire, you know, at the end of the day, you've done some great tracks and that sort of stuff, sit around a campfire, have a few, few drinks and and uh, have a good laugh and talk about your day. Absolutely cracking times and I've had plenty of those, but I don't know, just of late, over the last sort of 12 months or so, I've been doing a lot of solo stuff and it, it is feeding them. It is right up my alley and I just love it. Um, absolutely to the nth degree. So we'll go through as to why why that is. So probably the first tip um, I'm probably going to give you, if you are sitting on the fence, and this is probably going to be for those people maybe who are sitting on the fence and maybe wanting to try a bit of solo camping. Well, probably the first tip I'd probably give you is for your first one, don't go too remote, you know. Um, maybe go to some of the areas, you know, maybe where you have camped with other people in the past. And, um, you know, and you might not be the only one where you are, but at least you'll, you know, you'll go out there, you'll find a spot completely by yourself and sit up there and do that sort of thing there rather than go completely remote to, you know, some of the places where that I sort of end up going, especially around, around the high country where absolutely see nobody and completely and utterly by myself. So that's probably the first tip is, yeah, just maybe don't go too deep too fast and just do a few few solo trips. In that sort of format, just go, um, yeah, the, you know, where towns maybe aren't too far away, all that sort of stuff. People aren't maybe, you know, just camping down the road, um, but at least you're going to be on your own. You can, you know, have, have your sort of your solo camping sort of stuff that way. So, Greg there, what's going on there, mate? Good to, great to hear from you. Thanks very much for dropping in tonight. So, and the other thing, other, this is a big one that I get asked a lot, and, and it's a really hard one to sort of explain to people that don't sort of get out there and do it is, Fair income, if you're out there by yourself, solo camping, what do you do? Um, well, absolutely, I don't do a great deal, and that's probably one of the, one of the key things. I, I don't do a lot, and that's probably what I do like about it. But, you know, you, I, I go for a lot of walks, as you sort of see in my videos. You know, I go for a fair few walks and check out some of the areas that I go into. But I don't know, for yourself, you know, you, you might take a book or, you know, you might listen to, you know, some music, that sort of stuff. But for me, I don't take any of that. I, I don't take any books. I don't listen to any music pretty much. And my my environment is where, where I'm camping. That's that's my peace and quiet. And I just love love the uh, you know love my surrounds and and just really enjoy it for what it is, you know. And that's what I sort of like about solo camping is completely and utterly you know, that that uh, that peace and quiet and uh, you know forget about what's everything's going on at home and 
get out there and just enjoy the bush. So that's sort of where I'm going with it. Chris, how are you going, mate? What brand is your all skin? It's um, a, a dries bone, mate. So check them out because they are feeding them. They are just great. So, and what, uh, what what's the next one here? What uh, what do you do? Well, get been through that one. Um, solo camping um, um, will test you. Now, fair income, it is going to test you out. There's no doubt about that. If you're out there by yourself and you've not done it before, it is seriously going to test you. And somewhere along the line, you are going to get tested out because, you know, if you've been out there camping with your mates all your time and uh, with a group of people, well, if something goes wrong, well, you've got them to fall back on. Whereas when you're out there on their own, you've got absolutely no one else to fall back on completely but yourself. And and to a point, that's another thing I sort of like about it. You know, you, you're completely reliant on your own, your own skills and and that sort of thing. So that's another thing, too, that I certainly sort of like about it. And things will go wrong. There's no doubt about it. Like, it doesn't matter how many times you've been solo camping, things will go wrong, as, you know, the other that uh, last solo camping trip that I did up at the Pinnacles only a few weeks ago, you know, I had to jump out a few nights, a few times there that night, and, you know, I had to fix up my sweat. My, uh, my awning got blown down with the big, strong winds that coming through that night. Um, so, you know, there are things there, you know, you, you can't rely on other people to fix certain situations. You've got to absolutely do it yourself. And, you know, it's probably a good thing. You know, you go out there and test test your own skills, test your own ability. Um, and that's certainly one good thing about I like about with solo camping, that is for sure. Um, and it all comes down to your preparation as well. But, you know, before you leave home, you know, it, it, you know when, when you're going out there with a group, you know, you can – Maybe sometimes, you know, be a bit, uh, bit lapsed on, um, you know, on your pre preparation and what sort of gear you take because, you know, you might maybe forget something there one time and, you know, and your mates might have something as a backup to, you know, fill you in. But when you're out there on your own, you've got to absolutely be totally prepared for, you know, the places where you go camping and and um, and make sure you've got all the right gear for those places that where you do go because, you know, I like doing a lot of high elevation stuff, as you've certainly seen, and particularly this time of year. Um, I haven't got into the snow stuff yet, but, um, yeah, and, and when you're camping at high elevation, well, you know, you've got to be super prepared for those conditions because, you know, you just never know what's going to come through. So you need to be really, really on the, on the money and and have your gear all set up for that sort of times. Uh, touring, how are you going there, mate? One of the best things uh, about solo camping, about solo touring, is people you meet along the way will... I don't meet too many, that's for sure, on any of my trips because um, that's the thing that, um, yeah, I, I just base camp up and I, I just love going up there and, you know, and setting up by myself and uh, and doing my thing and, and uh, yeah, love being out there completely by myself. So it's, it's my, my, yeah, you might see the odd, odd person here and there, but pretty much I'm, uh, yeah, pretty much on my own. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing I, I like about solo camping, that is for sure. Now, this is the next next heading here, and this is going to be sort of a big one, and that's sounds of the bush. Now, I can tell you now, when you're out there in, in, in camping by yourself and, you know, you've got the sounds of the bush going on, whether it be, you know, during the day or during the night, that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing if you're just getting started out um, with the sounds of the bush because feeding and when, when you haven't got other voices around and other groups around and that sort of thing it's just you you are going to hear absolutely everything everything that goes on and and that's what I, again what i like about it you know I, I like to hear you know the birds carrying on the trees i like to hear you know the rivers flowing all that sort of stuff i like to hear all the surrounds of where i am but um but you know you at, at night times too is, is those sort of things when you hear sounds and that sort of thing if you haven't done a lot of solo camping well you know, there's certain things that you might hear at night where you're going to be wondering, oh, God, you know, what, what was that? Well, you know, there, there are other things too that you do have to deal with. But that's what I, I certainly do like about it. But, you know, you, you might go out there and you, you – but you might play a bit of music just to, you know, to maybe deaden, you know, dampen down some of those sounds and that sort of stuff. And that's all fine too if you want to play a bit of music or – yeah, you might be one of these people that absolutely get there and talk to yourself and um and that sort of thing. Mate, you you got no one else to talk to, so you might as well talk to yourself and and feeding them. I do a stack of it when uh when I'm out there making my solo videos. I talk to myself all the time. As weird as you might think that is, but I'm talking to myself talking to you guys because I'm making these videos. I tell you what, if there was some uh people was able to sneak up on some of my campsites and uh 
and you know, and just be able to you know watch what's going on at, at afar, you know, and, and watch what I'm doing there. Yeah, I'm talking to myself. Well, they think what sort of a nutcase is this bloke here? Because he's out there talking to himself and what's going on here. But I'm talking to you guys, and there's a camera out there. But yeah, so that's um that's what I do. I, I talk a stack to myself, and um because of those reasons, because I'm making videos for you guys. But otherwise, uh, you know, you might have conversations with yourself for other reasons. You know, just to you know, help yourself deal with those sounds and stuff and something things you know you're not superly comfortable with with um being out there in those remote areas. Um, would you like to? Would you? Would you like to like it? Uh, it tests your capabilities. It sure does. There, there, Stephen. It certainly does test your capabilities out, mate. It tests you out big time, and and that's again another thing that I certainly do like about it. And look. I've been solo camping for a long time. I haven't been doing it just in the last couple of weeks and the last couple of months sort of stuff since I've been making my videos and I've been solo camping for many years. And But feeding them, it will absolutely test you out. Um, and that can be, that's a good thing too, I think. You know, you just see how you deal with, you know, with certain situations and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I do like it. Um, but again, don't get me wrong, I do like going out with crowds and, and mates as well, but... Solo camping is just feeding them something about it. Now, the safety side of it, we'll get into the safety side of it because, you know, the safety side when you're going out there completely on your own, it is absolutely a big, big topic to actually talk about. And probably the key one there is, is make a plan and let someone know exactly where you're going to go and absolutely stick to that plan to the nth degree. Don't change it at all because, you know, if you, you, um, you know, you pass on your plan there to family or friends or, Something like that. And then you go and change your plan. You know, you might be driving along and you think, oh, this track here looks all right. I'm going to go down here. Well, you know, if, if you go down that track for whatever kilometres and something goes wrong, well, it also all of a sudden changes, you know, where people go searching for you. Because if you don't turn turn up back in time, you know, from the day when you said you were going to come back and certain times, whatever, well, it changes everything big time because they're not going to be looking down that particular track where you went to. So it is really, really important that, when it comes to solo camping, that whatever plan you make and whatever plan you pass on to someone, you absolutely 100%, unless you contact those people, you know, if you're able to contact those people and say, look, I'm going to I'm gonna make a quick change to my plan here. I'm going to go down this road or this track, whatever. Well, then that's all fine as long as they know where you're going to go. But but if you can't make contact with people that, you know, you've left that plan behind, well, fair income, don't go down there. It's in the in, in story. Just don't go down there. Stick to your plan. And uh, and then, you know, if something goes wrong other than that, well, at least they're going to know where to go looking for you. And the big, other big one too is, again, when you're out there on your own, you're out there driving by yourself, well, if you have a major breakdown or, you know, something like that, well, don't ever, ever leave leave your vehicle. Um, you know, you're going to be found a lot easier. It doesn't matter if you're in the high country or out in central Australia. It doesn't matter where it is. Don't ever leave your vehicle because, in the day, you know, your vehicle's got everything. You know, it's got your food, water, it's got shelter, it's got everything going on there. You've got your bedding, the whole shoot match in it. So you're far better off staying with your vehicle. And, you know, it's going to be so much easier to find, you know, a big bulky vehicle out there, whether it be in the bush or out in central Australia, rather than trying to find, you know, a little person from the air who's going to be wandering through, you know, some certain countries to try and get help. So, yeah, that's 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 absolutely a big one is to make sure you do so with your vehicle. And the other one too, and I, I look, I'd keep that drum this in. You've probably seen me with a number of my solo videos that I've done with, and that's the uh, little green um, pouch you see that's off my uh, off my belt there. Well, that's my PLB, my personal location beacon, and that goes with me absolutely everywhere. Um, from the time when I when I'm going out there, I've I already attached that. And, you know, if something goes wrong and, you know, I need to get emergency help, well, bang, it's just on my hip there and bang, I can get uh, help. And it's not a matter of if, but it's when, you know, those emergency services will come along. So, and there's certainly other things you can certainly go into, you know, we talk, start talking, you know, emergency um, beacons and stuff like that with sat phones and, you know, HF radios and all that sort of stuff. But you've got to really look into, you know, what sort of remoteness you're going to go and do and how far you're going to go and where you're going to what sort of setup you really, really need. And, you know, you, you know, UHF radio, I've been into, you know, there's a bit of talk there about um, repeated towers and how they can sort of help you, mainly in the high country. I haven't done much of it sort of with 
other you know states around Australia. But see with the high country, so check that video out there. But um, but you know, UHF has only got certain range, whereas you know your your PLBs, well, they're going to get you help guaranteed if something really goes badly wrong, where you do do need a medical assistance or whatever. If it's a life threatening situation, um, your PLB is going to get you help very very quickly. So. Absolutely get yourself one of those. First aid kits is certainly another big one. Now, I've got a little portable one there. If I'm going to go off for a wander, you know, sometimes I'll take that one with me if I'm going to wander too far away from a vehicle. Again, depending on what time of year and that sort of stuff, like if you're talking summertime, you're going to do a lot of walking and things. Well, you know, snakes are a, a big thing to sort of, certainly take into account and don't ever become complacent about snakes because especially during that summertime, um, is when you know they, they're red hot and you certainly need to be you know up with and prepared with first aid kits when it comes to you know snakes and that sort of thing too so yeah there, there's a couple of big ones plbs and first aid kits and uh, most importantly is know how to use this stuff you know it, it's all good having you know first aid kits and and that sort of thing too but I really highly recommend anyone or everyone should really go and do a first aid course. I've done mine with St. John's over many, many years, and and I do one every couple of years, and I'm pretty much due now for another update um, to go and do a renewal, uh, just to keep it, keep in touch with it all. So you know, check out your sort of your first aid courses and that sort of stuff. They don't cost a great deal of money at all, but. But, you know, they not only might save your life, but they could save someone else's as well. So definitely check out your first aid courses and go and get yourself one done. Absolutely guaranteed for sure. Um, and then when we get into now recovery gear, now I've spoken a little bit about my recovery gear over some a lot of my videos about where I keep it. Now, all my recovery gear is on the floor in, the, in front of the passenger seat there in front of my full drive. So I don't keep any of my recovery gear in the back of my full drive at all. It's very, very, very quick, easy to get to from where I keep it because, look, it's just me out there. So, you know, there's no one sitting in that passenger seat when I'm doing my solo stuff. So it sits on a big bag there with all my recovery gear for, you know, to operate my winch and, you know, straps and that sort of stuff is all right there, really, really handy to get to. So and that's a big one thing you've got to think about too is, you know, where is your recovery gear? And, and the other thing too is make sure, you know, you do know how to use that gear if you've got to use it by yourself, you know. You, you can't go get yourself into trouble out there and, um, you know, you get yourself bogged or whatever or run off a track and you haven't got your mates now to help you out. It's just you. So you've got to sort yourself out. So these are all things, you know, you need to fair and income you know, take into account with that sort of stuff with recoveries because that could happen, especially this time of year, um, you know, over winter or anywhere else. Um, could happen big time. Um, so, yeah, make sure your recovery gear is handy and you certainly know how to use it. That is a big one for sure. And the other one I've got here is um, is check that you have all that you need, right? So my camping gear is always packed, and that's probably one of the luxuries that I do have you know, with, with those boxes that I've got, um, the only thing I've got to put in them really is my food. And, you know, I've been through that. You can see my videos there where I talk about those boxes I've got. Um, everything's always packed all the time. So I've just got to pick those boxes up, chuck them in, and away I go, put my food in and my bag of clothes, and I'm done and dusted, and I'm, and I'm out of there. So I don't really have to think too much about, you know, have I got this, have I got that? Um, cause there, you know, if you're in one of those situations, you know, where your, your vehicle, you know, it might be a family truckster and, you know, you got to pull all your gear out or your drawers out, you know, all that sort of stuff and completely empty it and pack it all away. Well, you know, when it comes to going and doing a solo trip and you got to start getting it all out again and you got to start, you know, weighing it all up, you know, have, have you got all your gear that you're going to, certainly going to need, um, you know, and, and you could leave something at home, you know, as simple as, you know, just your pillow. Now, what are you going to do? Feeding them, what are you going to do if, if um, you know, you, you might go away and you've set your camp up, your tent up, your swag, whatever, and you think, oh, God, I've left my damn pillow at home. You know, what sort of a sleep are you going to have? Well, that's where you got to you got to make something up. You know, you don't want to, you know, wreck your, you know, your solo trip just for the sake of having a bad night's sleep. Well, you got to make something up, and that's what I mean. This is where this stuff feeding can test you out. And it can be just simple as, you know, stuffing some clothes in a bag and that sort of stuff. And this comes back to my, again, my scouting days because, you know, a lot of the hiking stuff that we did for many, many years, 
Um, that's how we made pillows. We didn't carry pillows with our on our hiking trips that we went away. You know, we'd go for hiking trips from anywhere from you know from a weekend to nine, ten days. And we certainly weren't carrying big bulky pillows, but we were carrying these sort of um, you know sleeping bags that you know packed down really tightly. And and all I would do is I'd get some some clothes out of my out of my backpack and I'd stuff that inside the bag of my sleeping bag, and that would be my pillow for the night. So. You know, there, there's things there that can, you know, just get you by. And rather than bugger a great night's sleep, you know, where you get all stretched and think, oh, God, yeah, I've left me damn pillow at home. What am I going to do? You know, or blankets or anything else. So, um, yeah, and that's, that's, that's the other thing there with that. And make sure you take extra of everything. In the day, you know, especially if you're just starting out and you want to, you know, try your first couple of camping, solo camping trips, well, Take extra of everything because you got what do you got to think about it? It's just you, you know, you haven't got, you know, a car full of people like you might you'd normally have. So take extra food, take extra bedding, take extra clothes, take extra everything until you, you know, you really fine tune your kit um, until you find out what you really, really need. Um, and, you know, and that's that's probably another, another great tip there is. Take extra of everything that you got. So there's this sort of working through that list there, but let's have a yarn to some of you guys because I'd feel you can be keen to sort of hear. Um, Glenn, there, what's going on there? Might be a good idea to do a, a group group trip first. Yeah. Um, you know, in some of these places where, where you might have been, that sort of backtracks a little bit to, you know, where I sort of mentioned earlier on the piece um, when, I, when I talk about don't go too remote first up. You know, go to some of the places, you know, where you have been either with, with your mates or, you know, where, you know, you, you might be around other people, but, you know, you could be three, 400 metres away from some. At the end of the day, you're still going to be solo. You don't have to sort of worry about so much about what goes bang in the night because, you know, when you're going to be out there completely and utterly by yourself. Um, but, again, you're still going to test yourself. So, you know, you're not, if something goes wrong, you might necessarily go up the road, you know, to – get some help from from strange campers up the road, you're going to have to sort out yourself, but at least you're going to have that sort of comfort factor that, you know, there are some other people around. Because, um, yeah, um, this this solo camping stuff, to go completely, utterly on your own out there in the bush, it'll feed and test you out. But one thing I'll give you the drum, if this solo camping stuff bites you, feed and you're an absolutely buggered because it's an amazing experience if you can get onto it. Um, yeah, like I said, you know, I just absolutely love getting getting out there by myself and forgetting about everything else that's going on in the world. And uh, yeah, it's a great, great experience. So absolutely, I can't highly recommend it enough for people to have a go at solo camping on your own. Leanne, I can reach reach mine from the driver's seat. I'm talking about, I'm thinking about that's your recovery gear. Not many patrols around around a rescue. Well, that's certainly a Toyota driver we're talking about there. So we'll we'll just we'll just forget about that one. <laughs> um yeah, done that. Used uh use my jacket as a pillow. So there you go. See, you've always got to come up with um with a we are with with a backstop. If something goes wrong or if something you forget something, you don't want to just pack up and think, oh, I'm just gonna go home because I've forgotten something. It's pretty simple. Make it up, make it happen. And and that's how you learn and and you know and gain experience and you know from those sort of things as you go forward with with each of your solo camping trips. And like I say, things will go wrong. It doesn't matter how many years you've been out there doing it on your own, whether you're just starting out or whether you've been a you know a year a seasoned solo camper, things are gonna go wrong. And you just gotta deal with them because you haven't got yeah, you know, your, your mates that you're familiar with going away with, um, you know, to to as a backstop. And, you know, if you can get to that stage to go out there and completely be on your own, completely on your own, as, you know, in these remote locations, oh, i tell you what, it is something else. It is something else. But it's really hard to explain to some people that that uh, that sort of don't get it. You've, it's one of those things, I think, yeah, you know, you've really got to try it for yourself and to really experience it. And you'll get what I'm talking about is uh, is when you get out there. But, you know, like I said, I don't take anything. I don't take music books or nothing because I just love the environment, love listening to the surrounds where I am. And that is feeding and that is my full entertainment for where I am. Um, long time no see, mate. Yeah, thanks very much there dropping in tonight. I um, greatly appreciate that. Uh, 
Cruising with Borgie. How are you going there, mate? Um, just did my first solo camp through Dargo and Talbotville. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, it was definitely – look, mate, I did see some of those photos that you uh, actually put up there. And, and again, you know, Talbotville is a, a fairly busy area and all the same with that Dargo area. But, you know, if you're just starting out, well, that's certainly a, a – you know, they're good areas to get into is get into places where there could be potentially other people. And, and what that does is, as I've sort of spoken about it, it just eases that factor that, you know, you're not out there completely remote on your own and, you know, because I tell you now that the mind games that can go on and they will go on when you're not around other people and you're out there on your own, the mind games will, will happen. There's, it's no buts about it, um, you know, but the longer you go on it and the longer you do, the more solo camps you do on your own, you feeling you start pushing that sort of stuff aside because you realise that you know, those, those mind games just don't exist anymore. But when you're starting out and you do your first solo camp where there's absolutely no one around, it's pretty remote sort of a place, at night, only at night time, yeah, your mind games are gonna gonna um, go on. There's no if buts about it. Uh, Ron, uh, here you go, there, mate. If you can handle your own company, you'll love it. Yeah, spot on, mate. And yeah, you just gotta if you can handle your own company, um, you will absolutely love this solo camping stuff because it is it is great stuff. Absolutely enjoy it. Uh, Ross, see your pies, mate. Yeah, they were um yeah, my pies are going pretty alright after the batch I made in my. Last solo camp trip. That was the first attempt I had with the pies there, um, there Ross. But I've made another couple, of, another batch today from home, and mate, these are knockouts. So these will go in my camp oven or my, my travel buddy in one of my next camp trips. Really, really good. Um, Bruce, here, what's going there, mate? Um, first trip with the with the old man, mate. That's that's good, mate. That's no worries. Uh, campfire. I started out solo camping. Uh, at remote caravan parks. Yeah, look, mate, that's the go. I got my setup right and now I always go bush on by yourself. And look, and that's exactly the same thing. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, go to a caravan park, um, you, but completely rely on yourself. But it's one thing with going around with other people, it's just getting around those mind games. And that's one thing it, that certainly does cure. Um, you don't have that problem is the mind games at night um, when other people are nearby. But yeah. When you get out there and completely and utterly on your own and there's no one else around, it's a different story. So start out, start out slowly. Don't go bang straight into a remote place and you know, and then try and work it out that way because it's probably not a good idea and you could have a bad experience, you never want to go again. So you now it's just like full driving, you know. We all start slowly, you know. You don't go out and do the most extreme tracks when you go and buy a full drive, you go bang straight into it. You start off slowly and work your way up to that sort of stuff. Well, Solo camping trips on your own is exactly the same. Start out slowly is, is a big, big tip. Get to enjoy it. Get to get your gear sorted out. You know, a few situations you've got to deal with um, is how you work them out. And then as you go forward, then you'll start to go a little bit more remote as you go. Is definitely the way to go. Chris, good day, mate. Um, have you had any bad encounters um, out there alone with wild dogs and other people, bad intentions? No, I haven't, mate. I've not had a bad experience yet. And a lot of people ask me about wild dogs and this sort of stuff. Look, I certainly hear them. There's no doubt about that. I hear them quite often when I'm out there by myself. The wild dogs don't concern me greatly at all. I've never had a bad, bad experience with them. Um, I've certainly got up, you know, the next morning at certain campsites and, you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, you know, poor prints around your camp. They do definitely come in. There's no buts about that, but, um, but the thing with the, the wild dog situation, it's a bit like on Fraser Island, for anyone who's been in Fraser Island, it's a bit the same sort of thing. As long as you don't leave any food lying around, um, that sort of thing, and, and don't give them a reason to hang around. As long as there's no food scraps lying around on, on the ground there um, or in your campfire or anything like that, well, there's no reason for them to hang around, but, you know, they, they're probably going to be very, very inquisitive, you know, creatures, and they're going to come in and, you know, and check out. They might smell what you've been cooking overnight and then, you know, they might sense, you know, things have gone quiet now, so let's go in for a wander and check out what's going on there. Well, you know, if as long as there's no food, you know, lying around on the ground for them to, you know, get stuck into, well, there's no reason generally for them to hang around. And, you know, and as you can see, you know, I always camp on the ground and I've never had anything in the way of that sort of thing, you know, scratching my swag and, you know, dogs trying to get into my swag. Absolutely fair income does not happen. But, you know, you might get the old bush mice or something like that, bush mouse that'll run over the top of your swag in the middle of the night. But, hey, that happens. But, yeah, the animals, dogs and that, never, ever had a problem with them at all. 
Uh, for the past 13 years, I've been solo camping with my dog at a, at a secret beach spot. Uh, sadly, my pup died. And that's, that's really sad, mate. I uh, can't yet bring myself to to get the same spot. Yeah, that that's really sad, mate. And hopefully you can um, you can get past that one. But yeah, look, I'd love to get dog to at some stage. But obviously, the issues are with you know um, national parks and that sort of stuff. There, and reason why to have one. Uh, Daz, how you going there, mate? Sheepyard, sheepyard flat, and the campgrounds around there are a good place to start if things uh, go south. Go south of Mansfield. Yeah, look, Mans um, Sheepyard Flats a great spot. And again, if you go there on an off weekend, yeah, you, you, know, you might have you know maybe two, three, four, five sort of campers scattered out that whole area. It's a big area, but Sheepyard Flat is a great place to start out. And there's a number of spots here along the Harker River out of Mansfield there where you can drop in there. And yep, you're going to potentially have other people around. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just a good spot to start and very, very relaxing. You know, the beautiful sounds of the river going there in the background when you're sleeping there and you swag at night, you love the river going. Beautiful, beautiful spot. Drop toilets, that sort of stuff too. Um, so, yeah, Sheepyard's a cracking spot there to, to start out. Uh, Liam, the first uh, solo camps were in Mohalla and the Poplars near New G. Yeah, good good areas. Very, very quiet midweek. Now I go more more remote. So you, you've been doing it for a fair while too. And, um, yeah, so if you're going to go – Fairly remote. That's certainly um, that's certainly good. Look, you just got to work up to it though. And look, I, I love where I love the place I go, and, and I'm very very specific on the places that I look at that I know where I'm not going to find potentially find other people, and <laughs> I got issues with other people. But you know, when I'm going for a solo camp, I don't want to be around other people. I just want to fit in, get out there, unwind, get my camp chair out, set my basic camp up and enjoy my surrounds without hearing voices. I don't hear anything but just where I am. And that's one thing I really, really like about the solo camping stuff is, is just enjoy the bush for what it is. It's, it's amazing. But you just got to try it to um, see what it's like. Um, campfire there, mate. Uh, have you ever had any close encounters with snakes? No, never had a close encounter with snakes either. Look, I'm very, very aware and very in tune of, of those over those times of the year. Um, I'm very careful about, you know, where I do certainly do put my feet and that sort of thing. I don't freak out over them and don't think, oh, you know, I'm not going to walk down there because there might be snakes down there. You just got to be very, very aware of them. We'll, we'll certainly do some videos of this sort of stuff when that time of year comes around because, you know, the snakes are certainly out there and, and we have really got to be cautious of snakes. Look, they can be anywhere, but um, the main ones is certainly around river systems and especially in the high country, you know, the hot, hot river rocks and water. And long grass is um, snakes heaven. Absolutely love it. So there are areas you got to be really, really careful of, about being around those areas. But we'll talk about that sort of stuff later on down the track as we go forward. G'day, Paul. Uh, thanks very much, mate. Greatly appreciate that. Love you dropping in here tonight. Thanks very much, mate. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Jaden, any bad encounters with people that you have run into? I've, I've never had... Look, you know, even right from my scouting days, and I've been doing this for over, you know, 45 plus years, I've never had a bad, bad encounter with any of the bad people in, anywhere or any of the places I've been to. And if, anything, if I have had one, I'd tell you right here, right now, but I've not had bad bad encounters with anyone, you know, yet, you know, walking into my camp. And, you know, I certainly have had a few people, you know, that might just wander into your camp, but they've never been bad experience. You know, they just generally wander in and, maybe have a beer with you or whatever else. And whether it be myself, I actually, I've never had anyone wandering my camera on my own, but I've had a few, you know, where I've been out there with groups of people, um, you know, I've been out there just wandered in and been friendly and that sort of thing, but never, ever had a bad experience with, you know, people wandering my camp and especially out there by myself, never, ever has that happened up to date. So, yeah, so there we go. Um, wonder if you've ever been, uh, have you ever been solo camping with uh, Glenn? Around Glen Maggie, absolutely cracking place. I've not, um, I've not done any solo camp around Glen Maggie itself, around the lake there, mate. But um, look, Glen Maggie is a great spot, and uh, you can't camp around the lake anyway on the lake itself. But there's certainly plenty of places you can go there from Hayfield, Lacola, and then you know onto the, from there. But yeah, I haven't done any at all. Uh, Laurie, hey, oh, Laurie Bates. There you go. There we go. Another great chat tonight. Thanks very much. Um, I'm 70 and all, and uh, I solo camp all the time in New England mountains. Cheers. Thanks very much. That's unreal feedback. Greatly appreciate that. So th there we go. There's someone who's been doing it. Lowe's been doing it for many, many years and um, and that age there, absolutely sensational. It's good to see, you know, people getting out there and still doing it. Sensational stuff. 
Uh, Gordon, seems um, everywhere out, out of Sydney is full of people. How do you find the good remote spots? Um, I just know them, unfortunately, with the high – well, not unfortunately, but it's probably fortunate when it comes to the high country. Yeah, I, I just know the places where I can go. Um, yeah, where I'm not going to see any people. But, uh, yeah. So, but look, the hike, that's the thing with the high country, you know, it's such a massive area as opposed to other parts of, you know, camping areas of Australia. Um, you know, the high country is just a massive area. We're talking nearly a million hectares between state and national parks of the Victorian high country, Alpine Victorian high country alone. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty of places where you can go and get away from people, that's for sure. Um, Nick, no, nah, button man, no, mate. Never had button man. I've never even laid eyes on the bloke. And um, I don't know whether I want to or not, but, um, yeah, heard mixed reports about him, but, you know, just got to deal with that one if and when it comes along. Um, g'day, Nick. How you going there, mate? Start watching your videos, uh, which inspired me to go to go to solo camping. That's great, mate. Um, that's great. It's in, uh, inspired you to get out there and have a crack at solo camping, and hopefully it's going well for you because, um, you know, solo camping, yeah, it's not for everyone, but, oh, geez, I tell you, if, if, you, can, if you can get hold of it and once it bites you, Fed income, you are absolutely buggered. Uh, outdoor boys, um, uh, you get into some awesome places. Do you carry a rod? Look, I, I do take a fishing rod with me occasionally, but the uh, trout trout season's now fish finished uh, for the high country until I think it's November now. But yes, but I will will get the rod going again um, once the trout season opens up again uh, a bit later on in the year. Because, yeah, there's plenty of places, mate, that I do camp up beside rivers where it'd be good to – I've done a couple of solo videos here, you know, where I chucked the line in and, and uh, you know, had a bit of a go. But, look, I'm no fisherman, that's for sure. But, um, but you know, you just try your luck. and But, again, it's just the peace and serenity of all about standing beside a mountain river and throwing a line and whether you catch anything or not is irrelevant. But if you catch something more fitting, an absolute bonus. But it's just that peace and quiet which – um yeah, which I, I really like about it. Um, big fella, how you going there, mate? Um, when my, my best mate passed away, I had a had a new mate in the in oh, he's talking to someone else there. That's all that's all good there. Oh, we're starting to flick through here. Um, don't worry about button man, it's the uh, young bucks paint playing doof doof. Yeah, I've look, yeah, button man's just one of those things, and um, yeah, I don't know. Great deal about it. I never heard of him until this all came to light with what happened down there in Wanagata earlier on a few years ago. Um, solitude and recharges the batteries for sure. It does there, Eric. Absolutely, mate. Um, yeah. You just gotta just gotta give it a go. That's all, all I can say, you know, is just try it out um about that sort of thing and see where you go. The possums are, are pretty bad out these ways in WA there, mate. Uh, we don't have any possum, certainly uh, no possum issues. In the high country, that is for sure. And, uh, yeah, so no no possums going on over here, mate. Um, no yowies, no yowies, that's for sure. No yowies are all gone. Uh, Jack, how are you going there, mate? Uh, what do you think of the <laughs> happy vans and cobbly cobbies? Oh, I wish I still had an old combi, I tell you. I had one of those years ago. But, um, yeah, that'd be a great thing right now. I don't have one, but they'd be an absolutely cracking vehicle if you had one right now today. It'd be great. Um, where are we now? Up to um, g'day, mate. Co <laughs> South Wales is stopping us. Yeah, mate. I uh, I hope things sort certainly sort out in uh, in New South Wales at the minute and um, down the track, mate. Because yeah, not in for a good ride there at the moment. But really, we're really thinking of you guys up there in New South Wales. Um, yeah, don't knock the combis, mate. Lone Brothers, they certainly did have one earlier on in their many many early years. Paul, been following. I've been followed by you've been followed by wild dogs walking a river along fishing up up the high country, but it uh, it kept its distance. I was glad there wasn't a few of them. I often hear them at night. There's an interesting one there. I, look again, yeah, I've never ever been never been followed. And look, yeah, it certainly won't lie. You know, some of the times, you know, when when I do go for my walks, in um, yeah, you might have the glance behind you. And again, it's just one of those things, you know, plays on your mind, you know, when you're out there on your own, walking by yourself out there in the bush, you know, you, you just have a bit of a glance behind and sometimes, you know, you wish you had eyes in the back of your head. But I haven't had that experience there, mate, uh, there, Paul, um, where I've been followed, stalked or by wild dogs at all. But 
Yeah, I certainly hear them a lot. There's no doubt about that. They're certainly out there. Um, but as I said earlier on, don't give them a reason to hang around your camp by leaving, you know, food scraps and that sort of thing. And, you know, they might come in a bit inquisitive, but they'll generally nick off, which has been my experience after so many years. That's been my experience with the wild dogs um, and the places that I've been camping. No dramas at all. Uh, Jimbo, uh, any El Dorado is beautiful for solo camping. Yeah, look, I must get back to El Dorado there at some stage. El Dorado is a great area if you've not been over that way. Some great tracks over there. Got a video there on, on the channel there about El Dorado, the smallest pub in Victoria, so um, and uh, that sort of stuff. And the dredge, a lot of stuff to see around El Dorado. Really, really nice area to go and have a look at. Um, do you ever ever do any beach camping well no i don't do any great deal of beach camping because there's not there's really none we can do um here in, as far as victoria goes you know i've done i've been to fraser island morton island those sort of things but um but yeah as far as victoria goes there's no beach camping we can do at all so that's a real shame which i wish we certainly did um that have that sort of thing um c c r j how you going there mate uh, do you carry a firearm no i don't no firearms at all, um, don't have a gun licence, don't have a gun full stop. So, yeah, no firearms in, in my vehicle. Might carry a stock whip or two if that carries as a, as a firearm. But, uh, yeah, no no firearms, mate. Uh, Paul, I uh, reckon I met but re reckon he met Button about 20 years ago upstream of Zika Spur on Wanangatta. Harmless bloke, has his, uh, has his patch around King Billy. Yeah, apparently that's where he is up around King Billy. Uh, just gave him a wide berth. Look, yeah, look, I've certainly heard of some stories, you know, from where he has wandered into certain people's camps. But hey, I don't know. I, I've I've not come across him. So um, yeah, I haven't been over. I haven't been over that Mansfield area for a while, and I've I've done some solo trips. I've got some solo videos there on my channel where I've been right through King Billy and camped up there on, you know, on on, uh, on Howard High Plains and and bluff around Bluff Hut and that sort of stuff and. I've, I haven't had an experience with him, so can't really talk much about the old button man. Uh, what's the creepiest things ever happened to you while solo camping? I haven't got one, mate. I'm feeding him. Do not have a creepy story yet to give you about anything that's going on with any of my solo camping stuff. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's it's weird. I'm sure some of you guys that have got some got some solo camping experience have have got some stories to tell, but. Mate, I don't have one. I don't have any any bad experiences yet with any of my – and that's not to say it's not going to happen, but at, up till date, yeah, I haven't got one at, at all. Uh, Cruise me, Borgie. How are you going there, mate? Um, I agree with you with you too. It's, it's amazing the feeling you get with solo camping, something that uh, that cannot be explained. It is It is one of those – absolutely one of those things, you know. You know, if, if people ask you, you know, that – don't either don't go camping or you know or haven't done any solo stuff on their own especially people that don't go camping because i've had this conversation with a few people and they they look at it like you're weird you know <laughs> they they think what do you go out there by yourself for and, and what do you do and how do you entertain yourself or well, you know you give them a basic rundown look which i'm trying to give to you guys which i've sort of spoken to you guys tonight about you know a bit of a rundown about you know what i do and and you know what i get when i go out solo camping but if you haven't done it before and haven't experienced it, it's a really, really hard thing for people to get the gist of until you go out there and do it for yourself and then you'll go, yep, fair income, that's what it's all about. So, yeah, you can, you can give people a rough idea, but other than that, it's a really, really hard one to sort of explain to people. Um, what's your favourite spot outside the Vic High Country? Um, there, uh, Leroy, how are you going there, mate? Um, look, I've done uh, – I'd like to go back to Fraser some stage, but, look, I've got big ambitions to – I want to get up through Central Australia. I'd like to do a lot more, you know, Simo and and those sort of places. You know, I've done, um, uh, you know, a couple of the couple of places up through there with border track and, and that sort of stuff. But I want to go further and beyond that. But, you know, in these current times just makes it really damn hard. And, uh, yeah, yeah I, look, as much as I love the mighty Victorian eye country and – Modern Victorian high country for me will always be home. You know, I absolutely love the place, but I do want to step outside it and uh, and do some other stuff. And I've got certainly some some plans coming up once we can travel a bit more is to do some more within Victoria outside the Vic high country. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, 
um, th there's plenty of places to go and look at. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, they, they do. They are the, the, uh, stock whips. They they do sound pretty good when they echo across the across the valleys and that sort of stuff. G'day, Brad. How you going, mate? Love you. Thanks very much. They're dropping into Albury from New South Wales. Geez, mate, you're only just over the, over the fence there in New South Wales. Hopefully, everything's going all right for you up there tonight. There, Brad, uh, we up there in uh, in Albury, mate, and uh, and stay uh, stay safe, uh, Brian. Uh, you certainly can't beat camping in the bush around Victoria, especially in the high country. Here, yeah, look. I keep banging on about the place and and I get asked, you know, that that a lot, you know, why do you stick around the high country? Because I don't know. I, I just feel you can love the place. And and because it is so, so different every time you go up there and, and you just don't know what the place is going to throw at you. Um, and it's the challenge. It's the challenge of, of the Vic High Country that I certainly love about it. And, you know, it's so different every time. And, and you've got to prepare for anything at any time. And um, whether you're out there, you know, on a solo trip or whether you're going out there with some mates. And it's one of those places where don't ever feed them take the place for granted and always treat it with the utmost of respect because the day you drop your guard on the uh, old, old uh, mighty Victorian right country is feeding them the day it's going to bite you and hopefully it doesn't bite you too badly because, yeah, it's one of those places. And that's what I do like about it. And that's probably what keeps me going back and back and back because – it's so different every time you go up there, and especially this. Well, any time of year, like this time of year, you know, you just never know what's going to get. But even during summer, you know, summer can throw all sorts of things at you. Um, yeah, that's what I do like about it. It's uh, it's the unpredictability of the place. It's a great joint, mate. Any advice for outdoor lighting? Um, I don't have any any advice for sort of outdoor lighting. Look, I keep mine pretty simple. You know, you've got a few lights there that I've got hardwired in the back, but Outdoor lighting nowadays, you know, you got to really look into, um, you know, if you don't want to go hard wide stuff, there's so many, you know, rechargeable lights on the market these days now, and simple rechargeable lights and LED lights and that sort of stuff. It's a it's a mind minefield you got to work yourself through, but there's some pretty simple stuff on the market these days when it comes to you know camp lighting and that sort of stuff without going hard wide. So have a good look at through that there, BJ's mate, and uh, check some of that sort of stuff out. Yeah, Flinders Ranges there, Eric. I'd made. I'd like to get up through there at some stage, and but yeah, we'll just have to see see how it, how it all pans out. G'day, Anthony. How you going, there, mate? Uh, we're we're lucky to have have a good good club and scout leaders in the seventies. It was great grounding. Look, absolutely spot on, mate. Um, yeah, look, I come from the early sixties when where I started out, but but yeah, and then I get into well, I wasn't in scouts in the sixties, but about, about the same sort of era, um, late sixties, seventies. And feeding them, look, they were absolutely the best part, best times of my life, you know, growing up uh, in my scouting days. The places I went to, not so much in Cubs, you know, Cubs was just a, you know, the old dib, dib, dib stuff. But, you know, the old Cubs was just a, a good grounding to go into scouts. And once I got into scouts and the places I went to in scouts was absolutely amazing, the stuff that I did. But when I got into Venturers, and Venturers started at, I think, at about sort of 14 through to 17, somewhere around that sort of age bracket, feeding them, that was absolutely taking me to another level. The places that we hiked and night hikes we did just by the moonlight and this sort of stuff, um, you know, hikes around Tasmania, Cradle Mountain for, you know, nine, ten days. Now, Cradle Mountain back in the 70s is nothing like what it is today. Um, yeah, they were absolutely amazing days, mate. So I, I completely get exactly where you're coming from there. Um, scouting days were absolutely feeling them sensational. And, you know, I suppose that's sort of what built me up to, you know, where I am today with, you know, this, all this solo stuff because you know, I've been doing this for a long, long time and that's where you got to work yourself up to. Um, what, do you, what do you think of the pinnacles? I'm not sure, Jaden, there where you've just seen my recent video, but feeding them the pinnacle, <laughs> pinnacles is um is an absolute knockout place, mate. So yeah, if you haven't seen it there, Jaden, go and check out my last video that I put up, my solo video that went up last Monday night. Check that one out, mate, because it's an absolute cracking spot. Uh, Kyle, uh, the deserts around around northwest Victoria. Yeah, look, I like to get up around there. You know, I've done a little bit around the uh, Murray Sunset and that sort of stuff, but I like to go further and. And, um, and have a bit of more of a look up through there. Not sure whether I should go by myself, but, yeah, maybe I, I will. We'll see how we how that all, all sort of pan, pans out. Uh, Tom, how are you going there, mate? I found the, found the high country will never run out of out of ores and R's. Yeah, 
and wows, it just won't, mate. It won't. And you can go to the same place. Look, you know, that video I did the other week, last last week, up around the Pinnacles, I couldn't tell you. I've, I've been to the Pinnacles more times when I've had roast dinners and meat pies all put together. But Finningham, I just loved it, loved the place. And, you know, and it's it's the same when I go there. Every time I go there, the ors and ahs and wows of the view is absolutely knockout. Absolutely love it. It's a bit like, you know, Craig's heart, that sort of stuff. You know, people say, you know, what do you keep going back to Craig's for? But, you know, it's a, just an amazing place to be in the Victorian eye country. Absolutely love it. And uh, so many places to go and see. Barry, uh, <clears throat> have you have you seen fireflies in, in your travels? Um, first time I saw them through. No, mate. I um, haven't had a great deal at all to do with fireflies, so I really can't help you out much there at all. G'day, Dave. How are you going there, mate? Uh, do you have a pair of, um, mon what is it, uh, for night vision? No, I don't. Um, I'll tell you what it would be interesting to do when you talk about night vision cameras and that sort of stuff. It'd be really interesting, I reckon, to get dropped into, you know, especially as a solo one, to get dropped into a re really remote part of the Vic High Country somewhere in one of these deep valleys, maybe where man's never set foot off, you know, maybe heli dropped in there, put some uh, night vision cameras up, maybe 50, 100 metre 100 meter radius around your camp there one night, and just see what, what goes bang in the night. It would be absolutely mind-blowing, I reckon. I would absolutely love to do it. I don't know how you arrange it, but... If someone can arrange it, I'm all up for it. It'd be fanning them sensational. You know, those few times here, you know, when I've stood on some of those mounds and you look down in some of these valleys and you think fanning and man's never been down into some of these. And um, yeah, it'd be wonder it'd be awesome to find out what might be down in there. It'd be a great experience, I reckon. That is for sure. Um <clears throat> DJs, um, yeah, I'm looking at uh, at Bin's track, uh, mate. Let's hope uh, we can um, we can get away soon. Yeah, look, I hope, mate. Hopefully, it all all uh, these travel restrictions all end up soon for everywhere, not just Victoria, but New South Wales as well, and we can all get back out there and do what we do. Would be uh, would be great. Um, one uh, one done, I've done one solo camp before. Took my little little boat in South Australia for four weeks, for four days, awesome experience, but just makes you think about everything. Every move you make is the uh, the right move. Yeah, look, absolutely there, mate. Uh, FJSC Adventures, mate, absolutely. And, you know, you, you do. You think about everything that you do, um, especially when, when you're starting out, you think about every move because, you know, um, if something goes wrong, you're bitten by a snake or whatever else or, you know, you have an accident out there, well, you know, you can't call one of your mates to help you out. You got to deal with it absolutely by yourself, and this is where safe the safety side of it is is massive. And to make sure you are completely geared up for that, and that's another reason why I carry that personal location beacon on my belt everywhere I go. Um, when whenever I leave camp, it's with me all the time. Just in those times, if something goes wrong in in one of those situations I talk about with snake bites or you know broken legs or whatever else. Um, you can get help, doesn't matter where you are, because you might not always get back to your camp to grab that PLB. So take it with you every single time, wherever you go. Um, Clement, um, oh, where are you going there? Just curious, uh, what um, memorable or favourite huts in the Vic High Country um, have I got? Oh, mate, there's so many of those because there's so many huts in the Vic High Country. But, look, I'm pretty partial to, to Lovick's hut over that Mansfield side. You know, I've had a fair bit to do with that Lovex hut, with the rebuild and to what it is today, and and the old brick trail that's now my handbag of flip, uh, flipping my camp boxes. Laid a few of those stones in the fireplace there, and we had a group of mates that helped uh, the Lovex out with you know building that the fence around Lovex hut and the stonework inside and on the floor and that sort of stuff. There's some amazing stories with um, with uh, Lovex hut. Uh, if you if you're not uh, familiar with where all, all that material sort of come from, especially the stonework on the floor in Lovick's hut, amazing stories come out of that. You know, some people probably sort of take that for granted, but you know, all that stonework in in the floor of Lovick's hut all came from the Lovick's family property down there in Merrijig. It was in their yards down there. It was all lifted up and taken up in trailer loads you know, one after the other up to Lovick's Hut and that's now its final resting place up there in the floor of Lovick's Hut. Now, there's some of those slabs, you know, if you've been to Lovick's, you know, some of those slabs are massive, you know, and they're, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 metres thick, some of those slabs, they're massive and, 
yeah, it, it took quite a few of us blokes to sort of lay those into place. And um, but yeah, amazing story and a lot of history around that hut with the Lovicks and out of Merrick there, man from Snow River and all the rest of it. So yeah, that's probably one hut that's sort of um yeah, very, very partial to is um Lovick's hut over that Mansfield side. And then you got Bluff Hut there too, you know, the Stonies. They're out of marriage too. That's that's their their family mustering hut there. Unfortunately, not the uh, original hut after it was burnt down in 2006 bushfires. But um, yeah, and Lovex hut's never been burnt down with bushfires. Um, it it uh, it's not the original hut that's standing there today. The hut there at Lovex is uh, it was crushed by snow, and believe it or not, from the original hut that was built there all those years ago. The uh, the roof on it was um, not as steep a pitch as what it is today and a uh, fair whack of snow fell on it one year and uh, collapsed the hut purely just under weight. So when it was rebuilt, they put a steeper pitch on the roof um, to what it is today and uh, hopefully, um, yeah, they won't have that problem again. But, yeah, Lovex is a cracking up. Absolutely beautiful love it going there. Uh, 12 Assault Centre Lights there, Ross, uh, very handy when solo camping. Yeah, look, they are, mate. Yeah, you just never know if... Yeah, you got your sensor lights going on there, and what are you going to do, mate? Though, if one if one flicks on in the middle of the night, what are you going to do if you see one of them turn on? Maybe not a good thing either. So, you know, um, you know, you might be lying in your swag and all in the, in the middle of the night there somewhere, and all of a sudden, a couple of your sensor lights flick on. Then, what are you going to do? You're going to start freaking out. So maybe they they not might not be a good idea at all for for especially for people starting out. Uh, Daniel, g'day, mate. How you going there, mate? Fingers crossed we're able to uh, to get out after this week. Yeah, look, let's hope so, mate, and uh, hopefully we can get out there and um, and all start getting out back out camping again. That would be great. Um, John there, how, how do you keep warm in the swag in the high country? I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the recent video that I did there, John, um, where I, I showed you the ins and outs of inside my swag, and it's just a couple of blankets, mate, and that's all it is. But I think that's probably one of the secrets to – why I stay warm inside my swag because it's it's fairly compact. Um, you know, some people might find it a little bit claustrophobic in my swag, but I think that's one of the secrets as to why it's so you're so warm because um, yeah, it's pretty tight inside and uh, pretty tiny. But yeah, I got a couple of woolen blankets in there, and that is it. Like even yeah, and I just always sleep and I sleep it straight on the ground, mate. And I'm always tasty. I don't think I've ever had a bad bad night, cold night in that swag at all. So yeah, it, it's just how how I stay warm. It's absolute cracker. Um, <clears throat> where else are we up to here, Paul? Um, what do you use to to mix your your own winter fuel? Do you use it off off the shelf? Yeah, I do. Um, and you know, I've spoken about this many times with my. Um, how I mix my own Alpine winter mix and um, what's it called? Uh, winter formula, I think it's called. Um, get it from any, most of the, uh, the you know, your super cheaps and those sort of things, Repco, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I, I mix it every single time. You know, I've had some people, you know, make comments, you know, overkill, this sort of stuff. Well, that's all fine. You know, if you want to call it overkill, knock yourself out. But for me, I'll continue to do it. And as I said in my last solo video, I – and particularly when I'm out there by myself on solo stuff, I take every sort of safety measure to the nth degree. And I wanted to make sure when I'm camping at elevation in snow country, when there's, there's a few pats of snow around that I want to make sure my patrol is going to start the next day when it's time to go home. So any time when I'm camping at this time of year from about sort of May right through to sort of September, late September, I'll mix my own fuel every single time. No guessing about it. I'll mix it every single time. Um, when I'm going to camp at sort of a thousand meters plus, and just just what I do, you know, it's, it's very very cheap insurance. I think the bottle costs, you know, eighteen under twenty bucks. I think for the whole bottle, and I think I get about four mixes out of that whole bottle. So hey, what's the big deal? So that's that's just how I do it. But and I and I won't change that at all. Um, yeah, just another safety aspect. And again, particularly when I'm out there by myself, is what I do. Um, any scary experiences in the bush? No, I've uh, no Connor. I don't have any scary experiences, mate. We sort of covered this a little bit early, but yeah, no, no, no scary experiences at all when I'm out there by myself, mate. Absolutely love it. Uh, have you named your <laughs> have I named my pies yet, Cameron? No, I haven't, mate. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens with the pies, but um, first up, they're absolutely knockout. I where I got this, um, where it sort of all started from, I got sort of just some basic ingredients 
off you know offline to sort of get you know get the ball rolling with the mix but feeding them i have changed it massively to stuff that i wanted in it and it is absolutely knockout these pies are feeding them they're great i reckon they are anyway one day i might run into some of you guys and i'll get you to taste test it and see what you reckon uh, Jason, how do you how do you stop the condensation building up? And I don't have any issues with condensation because I generally sleep. It doesn't matter all year round. I generally sleep with the front of my swag rolled up. I have slept the odd occasion, you know, with that front flap down. And yet, sometimes you know you, you might get the uh, you know few few beads of condensation moisture inside it for that through those occasions. But I always yeah pretty much sleep with that front flap rolled up. And like this time of year, I'll, I'll, I generally have a pillow. Or not a pillow, but a beanie um, tucked under my pillow there or under my mattress all the time. And I just reach under there and I chuck a beanie over my head if it's going to be maybe a little bit cold. But yeah, I don't have any issues with condensation at all, mate. Um, Alex, how you going there, mate? Uh, great topic. Do you take a thermos flask? No, I don't take any sort of thermos flask uh, at all, mate, on any of my trips. Um, yeah pour my water as I, as I need it, mate, so you don't have any trouble at all. Campfire Adventures, uh, does Alpine fuel have any adverse effects on the motor if used for long periods of time? And this is what I say to anyone, you know, just because the mix that I use, that that winter formula, don't assume it's going to be okay for your vehicle. I don't know how modern your vehicle is and, you know, these, these, um, you know, these late model vehicles with, you know, the very sensitive computer systems and fuel systems. Don't chuck anything down your fuel tank and do it till you do your homework to make sure it's going to be okay for your vehicle. Um, but I've never had any problem with it at all. The one that I use, uh, it, it's it's been no drums at all. And I've used this one for many years now, and and that's why I keep using it because I know my patrol starts every single time, and I don't have any dramas with it, and I mix it all the time at those times of year. Um. But, yeah, that's the thing with Campfire, mate. Just do your homework on any sort of winter mix that you're going to use. Uh, Greg there, PLBs are hard to come by these days. Uh, right, I had to wait a long time for something to come in stock for, for mine. Right, I'm not sure what sort of brand you've got there, but, yeah, I'm I'm, um, I'm not sure there about PLBs. But, um, look, it doesn't matter whether you're going away solo camping by yourself or whether you're going away for the group. At least someone in in that group or convoy, or especially on your own, absolutely, absolutely must. Fair income should have a PLB with you um, all the time. So yeah, I can't stress enough. Fair income for for what they cost under three hundred bucks, and that one I've got um, Rescue Link, I think it's called. That's R E S Q Link. Um, check it out, and um, it's a uh, and that's the one that I've got. It's got about a, I think a seven or eight year battery life on it for under three hundred bucks. So we're talking about fifty dollars a year of absolute hundred percent guaranteed peace of mind. You know, if something goes wrong and I just get to that bang, set the error, I'll push the button and just wait for you know emergency service to arrive. Absolutely must thing to have for the for the what they cost. Um, yeah, PLB is absolutely the way way definitely to go. No doubt about it. Must get one. So check out, I'm not sure which one you got there, Greg. I'm not sure which one you went up buying, but, um, yeah, check out that. Because there's a couple of others too, you know, when it comes to PLBs. There's some um, subscription-based ones where you pay, you know, X amount, you know, a month, whatever it is. I don't know how much it is, but and some of those you can actually send texts to family and friends and whatever, and, you know, that actually can track, um, you know, where you're going, this sort of stuff. So, um, whereas the one I've got, absolutely no subscription base at all. One-off purchase, bang, done and dusted, done, and there's no ongoing cost with it. But, you know, then no one can sort of track where I'm going other than the details I leave behind, you know, when, when I go. That's the only information that they've got. So if you're going to look into these PLBs and that sort of stuff, make sure you do have a have a look at those um, non-subscription as, as opposed to subscription-based ones and really see which one's going to suit the sort of touring and where you're going to go and, you know, and what you want to do to what's going to suit you. So, yeah, check them right out, that's for sure, because there's quite a few on the market there now with um, with those those sort of things. Um, Aaron there, what's the, uh, the King Billy track like from Howard around to the huts? Um, it's the, the whole King Billy tracks a pretty easy drive there, Aaron. It's um, it's certainly nothing difficult. It's a really really nice drive through. It gets a bit uh, rocky if you're coming from Howard High Plains towards Lubbock. 
uh, before it gets to the sort of the junction there of Brock's Road. There's a quite a few kilometres there where it can it does it is quite rocky. When I say rocky, you know, it's not boulders, rock hopping sort of stuff. You know, we're talking, you know, sort of this sort of stuff. Just slow going. There's absolutely nothing hard from driving from Howitt through to Lovings at all. It's just slow, really slow going in sections. Um, and you'll, you know, there's the you'll cross the McKell the up, really upper reaches of McAllister River along that track too. So yeah, really, really nice drive at uh, you know, certain times of year. Unfortunately, yeah, it's closed now, but um, after Cup Weekend, all going well. <clears throat> um, after the floods that we had earlier on in the year, um, King Billy will, should be, and hopefully we'll be back open um, after Cup Weekend or on Cup Weekend going forward, mate. So yeah, check that one out there, Aaron, if you're looking to do that. But yeah, other than that, mate, it's a yeah, I call it a pretty easy drive all the way through. Low range, but yeah, just slow going. See, so yeah, I mix my own fuel every time um, at Mount, Mount Coal, Victoria. Yeah, look, Mount Coal, actually Mount Coal definitely gets snow up there. I've been up to where the, uh, you know, the, the television towers and that sort of stuff up there and the icicle spears that can drop out of that. You need to be very careful up through there too because it can get really, really cold up through there if you've been up that way, mate. So, yeah, definitely well worth Look, anywhere, you know, we're, we're talking alpine country, anywhere above a 1,000. If you're going to be anywhere above a 1,000 metres at this time of year, um, I don't know. For me, I would not be going without mixing my fuel, but that's just me. So it's certainly well worth looking into it. But I've got a number of videos here on my channel there about where I took going in a lot more detail about alpine fuels and the mix I use and why I mix it and how I mix it, that sort of stuff. So check those ones out as well, and that should certainly help you going forward with um, when we're talking about um, Alpine mixes. Um, I'll be in the I'll be in for it. You'll be in for a taste test. Yeah, look, there's a few, a few putting their hand up for a taste test. Um, <clears throat> Anthony, I'm assuming your your pies would have a bit of garlic in them. Absolutely, mate. I don't make anything, mate, without garlic. Probably the only thing I don't put garlic in is maybe on my on my bacon and eggs in the morning. But other than that, everything's got garlic in it, mate. It's just great stuff. I love it. Um. Uh, Jaden, there, what do you do with editing your videos? Well, I do them all myself and I just use iMovie. That's um, that's all I'm using. Pretty simple sort of a program, but hey, it works for me and uh, yeah, I like it. So that's that's where I go there, mate. Uh, cruising, how are you going there, mate? Um, you'll be ha you'll happily taste test the pies, mate. I'm sure there's going to be quite a few that are going to want to taste test them, but we'll see how it, how it all pans out going forward there. Um, Daniel, how are you, mate? Oh, everyone's Graham's hitting the thumbs up. Thanks very much. Can I run 33s on two inch? On a two inch? No. Or you might. Oh, probably not. Yeah, you, you'd, yeah, 33s on two inch. You'd be probably borderline, mate. You might be scrubbing a little bit. So you have to probably, yeah, do some um, checking that out there, Matthew, with um, 33s and two inch lift. Oh, 33s and two inch. No, you should be fine, mate. No dramas at all, I reckon, with that one. But I uh, see so how, how that all pans out. Daniel, uh, you inspired me to go solo camping, working as a nurse on the night on the shift work. Uh, I never get to go go with the mates or nobody, and that's the thing too. You know, when, when you, it's hard to sometimes organise a group, you know, to go camping. If you want, to, if it depends what your flexibility is like and your time schedules are like, to what your mates are like, they might not always, you know, sort of gel. So you know, you can't always get away with your mates. So if you don't go by yourself, well, you know, you're not necessarily going to get out there camping. So this is where the solo stuff. He's going to get out there, get out there in the bush and go and do it. G'day, Carl. Thanks so much for wrapping it up for the chat there tonight. Uh, what's the most remote camp spot you've ever been in the high country? Well, probably the most remote place I've ever been. And when it comes to Vic High Country, is you, know, you can't go really any more remote than probably one and gather, I suppose. Um, that's as remote as it gets. When it comes to the high country, you know, it's, it's, four hours minimum in any direction. There's only three ways in and three ways out of Wanangatta. But it's four hours in any direction at the earliest of getting out and the closest town out of there is probably, it would be Dargo and probably the Cola, but yeah, you're four hours in any direction to get out of Wanangatta. So that's probably remote um, as it gets down there. Um, as when you're talking high country. Um, so yeah, that's probably probably about it, I reckon. Um, Wanangatta would definitely be the remotest place at all. Right, oh, how long have we gone on? Geez, we've gone on with you guys for over an hour. Well, I hope um, we might wrap this one up. So hopefully uh, some of you guys have, anyone sitting on the fence here at the moment looking to have a crack at solo camping, feeding them, I can't rate it highly enough. Give it a go, but I just can't rate it enough. Just start slowly 
and build yourself up to some of the remoter areas. And once you get into those remoter areas where there's no one else around, just you, the surrounds, and, and testing you, feeding is an amazing experience. So have a crack at it. Get out there and give it a go, especially in the climate we're in at the moment. But also at the same time, don't ditch your mates as well. So have a go by yourself. It's just great. Righto, guys. Thanks very much for tuning in tonight. New video coming in tonight, tomorrow night. Um, everyone, a lot, a lot of people have asked me about how I wash my patrol. I've been asked this for so many times. Well, that's coming up tomorrow night. Got some uh, tips there about uh, washing the patrol. So check that one out and it might help you out with washing your full drive. Good on you guys. Thanks very much for tuning in. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. Love these Sunday night chats with you lot. It's absolutely cracking. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Catch you later on. Uru. <laughs>